tonight, Lord, you will speak to us through your word. I pray, Lord God, that you will grant us ears to hear. And I pray, Lord, these words will go beyond this room tonight. And will go, Lord, far beyond this room, but into the heart of your church, your people, and even beyond us, Lord God, to have a penetrating effect, to have an awakening effect, God, to make us alive from the dead and to make us awake and alert and ready for the battle that we would truly be shaken, alerted. God, that we will be broken, humbled, but strong in our desire to do your will and your will alone and full of a, a godly fear, a righteous fear of God, a holy fear of God. I pray, Lord, only you can do this work in our hearts, but I, Lord, I desire it earnestly that you will do this work in our heart, that you will bring our youth alive from the dead and you'll bring our church awake from a sleeping state. That hearts that are cold and hard and set in their ways and have been for a long, long time would truly be awakened out of that state of, of comfort, state of acceptance of things as the way they are, and a state of not fighting and a state of not striving. And I pray that everyone together corporately would be by the Spirit brought into a place of fighting of striving, of seeking, of desiring, and fear, awakened, alert. Oh, Lord God, please bring us out of a slumbering state. Bring us out of a sleeping state. Bring us, bring us out of a place where we easily fall prey to the enemy because we're not alert and we're not watching. We're not watchful. We're not working. We're sleeping or half asleep or half awake. And so we're, we're confused and we don't see the way clearly. But I pray for eyesal for our eyes, that we would see clearly. I pray truly you will help us with our blindness or our nearsightedness or our loss of sight and vision and that you would restore it supernaturally. God, help us. If you don't help us, God, then we're, we're, we're doomed, Lord. If you don't, Put this supernatural eye salve on our spiritual eyes, God. Nothing's going to ever make us see. If you don't, Lord, open our ears somehow to hear what this Holy Spirit is truly saying right now through Jesus Christ on the throne, then there's no hope for us, Lord God. Lord God, if, if, if you don't speak to us individually and awaken us where we are at personally in our exact situation of life in the areas where we've been compromised or disobedient or cold or forgetful or hardened or whatever it may be, Lord God, then, then I'm afraid that, that nothing can change our destiny. Our course is already set and we're going to hit an iceberg because we're playing, we're like the t Titanic. We thought we were invincible and we'd already set our course and we did not take the warnings. We were not afraid of an iceberg. We thought we were too great for anything like that. But here we go barreling through the North Atlantic Sea and without realizing it, here we are eating and drinking and, and, and being merry, dancing and playing music and having a good time. And we don't even realize it, but we're barreling down the way to death. We are moments away from hitting a catastrophe that's so great that we will not even know what we hit, that we will not even know what hit us. And before it, and it's too late, we're already sinking into the icy waters of the North Atlantic to our death because we did not heed the warnings. We had no ears to hear. We did not feel how weak we were. We did not feel how dangerous our condition was. We didn't realize the enemy was real. We did not realize that we were actually, we were number to three rule. We felt we were invincible. We thought we were like the the Yi He Tuan, the the uh, the the Dao, the the Dao, the the Dao Jin Guru. We didn't feel like we we felt we were invincible. But actually, when we're in that state of coldness and sleep and unalertness and comfort and patterns and bondage, whatever, we are just like the Titanic. Rushing, rushing, rushing 
and a one great pursuit of comfort and pleasure and security, not realizing we're rushing towards imminent death. So I pray, God, have mercy on us and awaken us out of spiritual sleep. So that we would realize that our adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Let us see that tonight. Let us be alerted and awakened and let us change the way that we're living and the things that we're doing so that we will be on a different course. We will no longer be on a course that's barreling towards destruction. We will no longer be asleep. We will no longer be dancing the night away, eating and drinking and being merry, thinking there's nothing to worry about because we're safe. No, we're not. No, we're not. We're in a dangerous North Atlantic Sea that's filled with icebergs, and we better crawl. We better be so cautious. We better have an alert on every part of the ship. We better have people praying. We better have people looking out for the danger. We better, But we're not living like that. We're living like everything's okay. We're living like everything is good. We're living like we're safe and secure. And the Bible says they'll be saying peace, safety, and then great destruction will come upon them. And I'm afraid for myself. I'm afraid for our church. I'm afraid for our youth. I'm afraid that that's what will happen to us if we don't wake up. If we don't wake up, we'll be saying peace and safety and then destruction will come upon us. Death and destruction. God have mercy. Don't let that be. Don't let that be. We've had a glorious, glorious history. We really have had a glorious history. We've had God moving in our midst. We've had supernatural things happen. We've had miracles. We've experienced miracles. We've experienced signs and wonders and healing and conversions and salvations and dreams and visions and answered prayer. It should not be that we die on an iceberg. It should not be that we die like the boxers, like the like the Ihetuan, thinking they were invincible and the, the foreign bullets and the foreign uh, bombs would not harm them and then they'd die on the battlefield, blown to pieces by those very things they did not fear because they were so proud and so blinded that they forgot they were human. Oh God. Sometimes we also fall into a state of lethargy or um, apathy or coldness or numbness and we're about to drown and die. We're, we're about to, we're, it's like swimming in really cold water. Just before you die, you lose your sense of feeling. You don't feel cold anymore. In fact, you feel kind of warm. And then the next thing you know, you're dead. You're dead. Oh, Lord, let us not lose our feeling. Let us not lose our conscience. Let us not lose the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Not the conviction of our pastor or the conviction even of our of the teaching of our church but the conviction of the very spirit of the living God who gives life and breath to all men and he alone is the one that brings conviction of sins to all men and he brings true spiritual light to all men please may the Holy Spirit of God please not be driven away from our church God please I don't want you to be driven away from our church. I don't want you to be rejected from our hearts because we hardened ourselves or we've gotten cold or because we keep sending you away and sinning and sinning and we grieve you and quench you because we indulge our flesh, because we put comfort first, because we put security first, because we put laziness first, because we put the world first and we put the Holy Spirit last. Whenever you put the Holy, whenever you put the world first or Comfort first, we put the Holy Spirit last. So God, please, Turn us around and put us on course, the right course the right path and the right way 
not foolishly, not, um, not blindly, but alert, vigilant, sober, awake, watching and praying. Please, Lord, help us. We need a new awakening. And I pray that you will do that and start in us tonight. Jesus, help us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I believe we are making progress tonight, but there's a lot of resistance. I mean, there's a lot of resistance, but I believe that we are fighting. Praise God. We'll keep fighting. But the devil is resisting us. I can feel it. I can feel it. So I don't know if you guys sense that as well. But I also feel somehow like, you know, God is with us and God is wanting to help us. But we got to fight. We cannot give in. We've got to fight. We've got to overcome because it's, I believe that we're in it. I mean, there's nothing worse, nothing worse than being asleep in the church. Nothing worse than being asleep. And because when you're asleep outside, you don't know anything, right? So there's hope for you. But when you've been in the light and you've been in the truth and you've been in the church, you've been in the presence of God and then you fall asleep, even if it's only half asleep, it's just like, it's almost like the end is drawing near because it's very difficult to wake people up when they're asleep in the light. Like, it's, it's hard enough to awaken people in the world. I mean, we know it takes a miracle. It's of great proportions. But when we've had the light... We've had the word. We've had the work of God in our heart. We've had the, the vision of God in our souls. We've had this vision to serve God and to live for God and to lay down our life for God. And then somehow we've lost that. I mean, it is, um, it is almost... I, I mean, one thing it does do for sure is it, it, literally, um, it literally paralyzes the church. So in other words, like... The church cannot go forward. It's impossible because God leads people in the light. God leads people who are, you know, awake, right? And um, I'm going to turn this because I don't want to look at myself. It's distracting. But, um, um, and if we're like asleep and we're not alert, you know, we lost the fire, we lost the zeal, then... We're almost helpless. Almost there's no hope for us. I don't know if you guys realize like how serious that is, but um, it's easier to awaken somebody the first time than to have to awaken a Christian who's fallen asleep in the faith, fallen asleep on, in the way. It's, it's, it can be almost impossible because they already know everything, especially somebody who's been in the church for many years. And um, they've heard the word for so many years I used to say this all the time, and I, I saw it happen before my very eyes, but every time you hear the word, you're making a choice with what you're doing with it. If it's not changing you, like positively, then be assured you are changing, but not positively. You're getting harder. You cannot hear the living word of the living God that cuts to the heart, that divides spirit and soul, you know, that... that um, uh, uh, that uh, divides like the thoughts and intents of the heart and then not, not be changed by it. You're going to be changed one way or the other. So either you're going to be changed in a positive sense or you're going to go backwards. It's impossible. That's how it works. That's why you will have people that are in church for many years. At first they're going up and then they just kind of plateau. And then they seem to be going like this for a long time and then... You feel like all of a sudden they disappear off the, they fall away. No, no. They didn't disappear and fall away like, like suddenly. They were, whenever you're not going up, you're always going down. But you can't see it. It seems because everybody, they know the way to pray. They know the way to worship. They know all the right things to say. So it's like, um, you, we don't see it on the surface, but eventually they will fall off. Because they're going back in the heart. You're going, we're going, we're backsliding and falling asleep. And, um, I mean, one of the things, my prayer about coming here 
before us is I, I feel like somehow I feel like to some degree our church is asleep and um, we need a miracle because I don't know what to do to wake us up. I, I don't know. I mean, it's not, it's not in me uh, other than, I mean, God working, God by his spirit working in waking us up, that I feel we were somehow asleep. There, maybe not fully asleep, but we're asleep enough that we're becoming useless. Like we're becoming to a point where we're not, um, we're not very effective. We can't be used by God. And you know how a knife is, right? Like the knife, when it's sharp, it's very useful. It can cut through things, and it's it's great. Choo, 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 choo. But you know, when the knife is dull, and you try to cut things, it's very dangerous. It, it's not only is it almost useless. Like I have several knives at my house, like IKEA knives. Don't buy them. You use them like three times, and they're already dull. And then they become a, like useless. It's a knife, yes. It was made for a purpose, yes. But it cannot accomplish its purpose. Why? Because it's dull. Knives are not made to be used dull. They're made to be sharp. And Christians are not made to be asleep. They're made to be awake. God is not wanting to use Christians that are asleep. God is wanting to use Christians that are awake. And we are falling asleep. And some of us are asleep. And I think there's different degrees of the sleep. And, and so when we lose our edge, like a knife loses its edge... It's, it becomes useless. Not only useless, it becomes dangerous. Dangerous. Why? Because now you're trying to cut with it, and you have to you leap. You have to be. You have to do it very hard, and it's very. You might lose your, uh, you know, the uh, grip or something. You could cut your finger off. See, it's not sharp enough to cut the vegetables or the meat or the things effectively, but it can still cut your hand off. And so that's what it becomes like a Christian who's dull. They're useless to God, but they're very useless to the devil. You're made to cut Thai, to cut the vegetables or cut the meat or whatever, but you're dull. You're not good for that, but you're good to cut somebody's hand. And that's what happens with Christians when they lose their edge. They're no longer useful to God. Now they're useful to the devil. How? Well, they still have a mouth. And they still have eyes, and they see everything in the church, and they see, oh, I see the pastor like that. Oh, I see so-and-so like that. Oh, I see my husband or my wife like that. And they have a mouth, and then now they're judging. So now you're not only not useful, but now you're destroying the church. Now you're doing damage to the church. What sort of a person does that? Somebody who's asleep. If you feel sleepy, then stand up, okay, Jeffrey? If you start because I don't want you to fall asleep. Stand in the corner if you feel sleepy. Or walk around in the back, but don't fall asleep. That's what we're talking about tonight. And, but that's what happens with a Christian who falls asleep. Listen, you already know a lot of the Bible. If you fall asleep, you will be a curse the rest of your life. Everywhere you go, you will be a curse. You know, Israel was a curse. They were so cursed when they backslid. And God sent them, and every nation they went to was cursed by them. Why? Because they, were, they knew enough about God that they could never go back to the way they were before. But they lost their passion and their love for their, and their worship of God so that they're useless for God. Now all they are is bad for both. Bad for God and bad for the world, but good for the devil. Nobody wants them. And that's a Christian, when they, when they lose their fire and they lose their edge, they become dull. They become dun. They have no use anymore except to hurt and the Christians that are most dangerous in the world are those that have one time been on fire for God, but now they stay in the church with all of their knowledge and no fire, no passion, no fear, but all their knowledge and their mouth. I have a friend. My friend was a guy who when he was younger, his father would send him to, uh, to some some guy's house, a rich guy. They were a poor family from Mexico living in the U.S. And his father would take him to this rich American guy's house and leave him there for the weekend. I don't want to tell you what he did to him, but you can only imagine it was wicked, sinful, abused him sexually. 
And this guy was so messed up. He was not a homosexual, but he was abused when he was younger. And so he had this idea in his head that I'm, a, oh, I must be like a homosexual now because this guy did these wicked things to him. His dad let him do it. Wicked. When he was older, he started using drugs. And, um, and then he had this girlfriend. And he had many women because he wanted to prove he's not a homosexual. So he feels he wants to prove that he's a real man. So he will go and have all these women. And then he married this lady. And he would do that to his wife. He would leave his wife and go with all these other women. And uh, his life was such a disaster. His wife said, I'm going to leave you. And one day he came home and his wife left with their three daughters, or three kids, all gone. And he's there alone. And he's there alone and he said, I'm going to kill myself. I have no purpose to live. And he had a gun. And he went to get that gun and he was going to blow his brains out. And before he did, he said one prayer. He's not a Christian. He said one, he said, God, if you're real, save me, do something. And I don't remember exactly, but God spoke to him and said, look behind your, um, your dresser, I think it was. Look behind the dresser. God spoke to him, a sinner, a drug addict, lost. He's going to kill himself. And God spoke to him. Look behind your dresser. He did, and he looked, and he found a gospel track back there. I don't know how it got there, but apparently sometimes sometime somebody gave him a track, and he just took it and put it there, and it fell back. He never read it. And he opened the gospel track. And if I remember the details correctly, yeah, he had the gospel track, and then God said, get up tonight and go to church. And it's Wednesday night, and he's a Catholic. There's no church on Wednesday nights. It's Wednesday. But God said, go to... So God told him, God's speaking to him. Get in your car and go to church. And he obeyed. He got in his truck. And God told him, drive straight. And he drove straight. He didn't know where he was going. Is he mad? Has he lost his mind? There's no church on Wednesday nights. And then God said, go right. And he went right. And then God said, go left. And he went left. And he drove. And then he ended up at a church called Praise Chapel. And he got there. And he went. There was people out there in the, like right out the front door. And they're welcoming people to come in. And he said, and he got out there and he freaked. And he started crying. I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to kill myself. And they said, just calm down, calm down, calm down. And that night they happened to have a drama. It was a special service. They had a drama. You know what a drama is? Like a play, a skit. And they said, just calm down. And they had him sit down in there. The lights are out and it's called the judgment. The drama is about the final judgment. And so he's there and he's watching this judgment. Everybody's died and they're facing God, the judgment. And he sees one person go up there at the judgment. And he said, I was a good person. I did this and that. He said, you're a murderer. God said to him, Jesus said, you're a murderer. I never killed anybody. You committed suicide. You murdered yourself. And my friend, who was absolutely shocked, he said, this God is directly speaking to me. He was on his face. He was weeping. He was crying out. And then in the skit, and then a guy dressed in white came. He actually thought it was Jesus. He really thought it was Jesus coming. He was like, Jesus, save me. And, and he actually, he got radically saved. His whole life was changed. He became, when I went, because during the time I was in China, but that was my church. That was our church in Dallas, Praise Chapel. I, when I came back from China for a time, I became very good friends with him and his family. We spent so much time together. We used to go to the church and pray together. We would pray for hours together. We, we, would, um, we would go out and uh, evangelize and, and do many things together. Many, many Bible studies together. Many, many, many wonderful things. Joe was on fire for God. His wife was on fire for God. Their whole family was changed by God. But Joe was in church 
for a long time. He was very close to the pastor and his wife, and he got bitter. He was bitter. And when I would go there, when I would visit from America, I would talk to Joe and try to encourage him. I could notice he was getting a little bit bitter and try to tell him, he said, well, yeah, but pastor's doing this and, and his wife's like this and always had criticisms. Yeah, but you, but you shouldn't look at it like that, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, to make a long story short, Joe, now I said his name, but it doesn't matter. He left the church. And I want to say he did more than leave the church. He left God. He lost his fire. He lost his edge. And everywhere he goes, he speaks evil. He speaks evil of my pastor. He speaks evil of his wife, our pastor's wife. He speaks evil of our church. I don't know, he might even speak evil of me. He is now, at one time, he was an instrument in the hand of God. He had such a powerful testimony of how God worked in his life and his family. And now he is an instrument in the hand of Satan. He still goes to church. He goes to another church. But he's bitter. He's cold. And he's full of venom and poison. I mean, can you believe that God literally was speaking directly to this guy in that way? So supernatural. When I hear the testimony, I'm absolutely amazed. And there's other things as well. I could tell many stories about how God worked in his life supernaturally. Was that the devil? No, it was God. But what happened to Job? He lost his fire. He lost his edge and became now a dull knife. He's still in the church, but he's only good for evil. He's only good for evil. He's only good for destroying the church. He's only good for cutting off fingers or cutting off hands or doing deep wounds to the body. But he's no longer good for his original purpose, which was to cut tie or to cut meat or whatever. Listen, that's what you will become if you lose your edge, if you fall asleep in the light. I don't care who it is, any of us. If we become dull, if we lose our edge, if we lose our, our passion and our true focus, then we will have a lot of knowledge because you guys have a lot of knowledge. You've heard a lot of sermons already, a lot. You know a lot. But it doesn't mean you're mature, but you've heard a lot. So what will happen is you will have all of this knowledge and you can only use it for destruction. Destroying yourself and destroying those around you. So let's turn to Matthew 24. All I can do is give us the warning that this is what's going to, that's what will happen. Listen, that's what will happen. Now, what about the guy living like that? That still goes to church, but he's bitter and he, his mouth, he's always speaking critical, evil things. And then he's, what's going to happen to a guy like that? If he doesn't repent, he's going to go to hell. And he's going to take other people to hell with him. Why? Because he's become a stumbling block in the church. How? Because he has a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience. And other younger people will look upon him and make him the standard. And they will become like him rather than like Jesus. So now, remember the verse that says, Woe to you that cause others to stumble. It would be better for you that a millstone were wrapped around your neck and you were tossed into the sea. Than that you would cause one of these little ones to stumble. That should be a wake up for us, for us older ones, if anybody's online. If we, if we cause any of these younger ones to stumble, woe to us, woe to us. God have mercy. If they look upon our cold example, if they look upon our sleepiness, if they look upon our lack of 
diligence or fervency or fire or passion, etc., and they make that the standard and they conform to us rather than to Christ. Woe to us. Woe to us. We cannot take those words lightly. Jesus spoke those words to his own disciples. We have to take those seriously. We cannot. God have mercy. And I just pray, God, please, Lord. I just want to pray for myself. God, I do not want to be a stumbling block, Lord, ever in my life. I pray, God, please keep me from this sin, Lord. Keep me from this sin of causing others to stumble, Lord God, whether by word or deed or anything or even because I lose my own passion or anything. God, please have mercy on me, Lord, as an older brother in the Lord, that I will have the example in the life, Lord God, but most of all that I'll have the right relationship with you and the fire and the passion, God. I don't want to be a stumbling block, Lord God. I don't want to be a stumbling block. I don't want anybody to stumble because of me, but please, so please forgive me, Lord God, and all of my sins and everywhere where I have caused others, others to stumble or where I have been a bad example, I pray you'll forgive me and cleanse me, Lord God, and take that away, oh God. And I pray, God, for our church. I pray especially for the older ones in our church, God, that we would not be stumbling blocks, Lord God, that there would not be anything within us, any pride uh, pride or, or complacency or any sort of attitude also that would be a stumbling block to the youth, Lord God. Forgive us, Lord God, and take away the stumbling blocks from our midst. Take away the bad examples from our midst and always excusing ourselves. But God, let us not just confess our bad example, but please that we would change our bad examples, Lord God. Crush us, smash us if, if necessary, but change us, Lord God, whatever is necessary, but don't let us keep being the same, Lord God. If we have to be crushed, then crush us, God, but don't let us stay the same. Don't let us always be like we are, hard and proud and cold and lazy. God, bring us back to our first love, God. Bring us to a, a state of alertness. Make us awake. Cause us to be awake, oh God, I pray. Please, Lord God, bring a love for you and not a love for things, not a love, love for comfort or a love for the world. Bring us a love for the Lord Jesus. Bring us a love for the Holy Spirit. Bring us a love for the kingdom of God. Yes. Let us be anxiously awaiting your return. Let us do a pan, pan, panja, do a need a dalai, panja need a zailai. Let us, Lord, oh God, long for your return. Long for your return. Long for your return, God. Day and night, Lord. Lord God, Lord, let us be waiting like the diligent servant waiting, 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 waiting for his master's return. God, let us not go to sleep. Let us not beat the servants and eat and drink and beat the other servants. Oh God, that's a, a backslidden Christian. It's a backslidden believer. Oh God, let us not be one. Let us be awake. Let us be alert. Oh God. Please, Lord God, wake us out of these slumbers, spiritual slumbers. God, religious slumber, spiritual sleep. God, you've given us so much, but we've returned so little to you. You've given us so much and you would, get, would give us so much more, but we're often like David. We go for Bathsheba. After you've given us so much and we still go for another woman, another idol, another sin. God, when you wanted us to go for you, please help us to conform our lives, Lord God. Lord God, please, Lord, let, I don't want you to pour out so much abundance on us in vain. All the grace, God, all, oh, give us fire, give us fire, give us obedience, give us fear, give us reverence, give us passion, give us love, God. God, give us action, action, action. No more words, not just words, but action. Action, action, action. Oh, God. Please conform us into your holy image. Make us, make us into your holy image. Meet with us tonight and mark us. Fire! Lord, fire! Lord, fire! Burn us! Burn us, burn us with the fear of the Lord. Burn us, burn us with your word. Burn into our hearts, burn into our hearts, burn into our hearts. Speak deeply, speak intimately, speak closely, speak, speak clearly into every one of us, into each one of our hearts, God. 
that we may know the voice of the Lord, that we may know the voice of Almighty God. Please, I pray, Lord God, awaken us. Awaken us. Jesus. 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 Lest we become dangerous. Lord, lest we become useless, and not only useless, but dangerous, God. Our gossip is dangerous. Our bad attitude is dangerous. Our pride is dangerous. Our judging is dangerous. Our lack of love is dangerous. Our lack of passion is dangerous. Our lack of love for others is dangerous. Lack of patience is dangerous. Please, Lord God. Please, Lord God. Jesus. Jesus. Please, Holy, Holy Spirit of God. Jesus. Jesus. Awaken us. Awaken us. God. Let us not lose our edge. Let us not fall asleep. Let us not become dull. Oh, oh, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another. That shall not be thrown down. Now I want us to look at this a minute. We need to take um, into consideration the context of this verse. Now if you notice, if your, your Bible above chapter 24, chapter 23, it's, almost, it's all in red in some Bibles, isn't it? Why is that? Because Jesus is speaking. This is the continuation of the sermon above. So chapter 23 is the sermon he's preaching. And then 24 is the continuation of that. So look at what he's preaching in chapter 23. Like, let's look at verse 37. Uh, oh, let's go to the back further even, 31. Therefore you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He just pronounced judgment on Israel. He just pronounced judgment on Jerusalem. He just pronounced judgment on the Jewish nation. He just predicted their downfall. He could just condemn them to hell. Did you notice that? This is very, very heavy stuff. This is not just like your run-of-the-mill everyday chit-chat. This is this is like like unimaginable. This is absolutely shocking. This is almost impossible in the mind of a Jew that this is even going to, that this could ever possibly happen. And Jesus just proclaimed a terrible judgment over the Jewish nation and the Jewish people. And then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And look at what happens. This is amazing. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. Listen to what just, look at what just happened here. Jesus just dropped the heaviest message on Israel that's ever come in their history. The heaviest teaching his apostles have ever even heard. 
This is heavy. I imagine Jesus was absolutely filled with the Holy Spirit. I imagine this was absolutely shocking. I imagine the people were trembling. They were shaking. Some of them were probably crying. And then this disciple will say, did you see the building over here? Oh, did you see the marble? Oh, did you see the pillars, how big they are? You've got to be kidding. What's the matter with you? Did you just hear anything I just said? The heaviest message in the word of judgment, the living word of God released, I just predicted, I just prophesied what's going to happen to Israel. And you want to talk to me about these buildings over here? You want to talk to me about the marble? You want to talk to me about the pillars? Are you out of your minds? Something is wrong with this picture. So Jesus rebukes them, doesn't he? He says, do you not see all these things? Listen to this. They are probably talking about how pretty the temple is, how big it is. They're from Capernaum. They're from the Kampung. They're from out in the countryside. They've never seen it. Look at these pillars, man. That's so cool. Wow, look at how smooth the marble is. Whoa, even Solomon was here one time, you guys. Solomon, you know, this was... And, and, and Jesus just looks at them and says... Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. What did he just do? He just poured cold water on them. He gave them a smack across the face. Would you wake up? Did you not hear what I just taught? Did you not understand what's happening? And now you're wanting to talk about this building and stuff and how cool it is and how pretty it is. I imagine when they heard him preach, they were also like, oh, wow, yeah. But why is it? What is it about us that the next moment we're talking all the nonsense of the world? One moment we're hearing the eternal word of the living God and the next moment we're talking about food, we're talking about doing something, we're talking about going on a holiday, we're talking about school and how much work. What's wrong with us? I don't know, but something is wrong with us. And I see that Jesus had this same problem with his own disciples. It's a human thing. It's very difficult for us to remain in the presence of God. It's very difficult for us to remain in the mode of meditation. I mean, look at last night. We were in the car. We're talking all the, these very serious things. And then a few moments, a few moments, and then we're just joking and talking. And everything. And the rest of the way, we're just playing and, and stuff like that. What's wrong with us? I don't know, but something is wrong with us. So we need to have wake-up calls. We need to sound the alarm. We need cold water poured on us because we have the tendency to fall asleep in the light. And I believe that's what the Lord did here. He goes right back. Notice this. What he's talking about above, the judgment coming. Your house is left to you desolate. Uh, I say to you that the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered, etc. I surely I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. In other words, you're doomed. The wrath of God is going to come upon you and absolutely destroy you. And they want to talk now about how cool the buildings are in Jerusalem. And he tells them immediately. Do you not see all these things, all these things that you're excited about, all your school homework, assignments, your new computer, phone, uh, you know, the meal, the food that we're eating, all these things. And he cuts through all of that. You know, it's kind of mean. In a sense. It's kind of mean. It's like, I just got this new computer and now you're telling me it's going to burn in the fire? 
It's like kind of mean, isn't it? Like, I'm enjoying this new cell phone. I just got this new phone and it's like really cool and I'm enjoying it and you're telling me, you're telling me one day that's gonna be smashed into a thousand pieces. I mean, it's like, we just bought this new car and we're, we're really <laughs> enjoying it. And you tell me it's a trash can on wheels, it's worthless, it's gonna burn up in the fervent heat of the Lord's return. It's like, you know, it's, like, it's, like, it's kind of like, it's like mean. Yeah, if you're a humanist, it's mean, isn't it? If you're into humanism, it's mean. Ramban Jui, it's mean. But it's what Jesus did. Not because he was... Um, I'll say it like this. He, he did it for the sake of their own souls. He did it for the sake of their own souls. And we need a wake-up call. We need a wake-up call. It's almost like we're firemen, but we're, we, lo we, we lost our skill, and now there's a fire, and it's like we don't know what to do. Oh, I feel that sometimes like during our prayer meetings or, or a few times in our service where, where God's power and presence was there so strong in a supernatural way, and it's like, like the fire is here, the firemen, they don't know how to fight a fire anymore. And sometimes it's like, I, I, one time I remember afterwards looking at everybody, it was like everybody was honestly, I'm not, you have to understand how this word, what this word means in English, but everybody just looks looking stupid. Stupid doesn't mean like no brains in this context. It means just like stupefied, like, huh? Huh? That's not, I don't think that's good. I don't think that was normal. It's almost like somebody got hit and didn't know what happened. We should be alert. We should know what just happened. We should know that God just came down and spoke. It was the night when I prayed for you guys. You guys, I think it was the three of you. I, you guys came to the front and I prayed for you at the end. That was that night. Do you realize the things that were prayed over you that night? Do you realize who was praying over you that night? It wasn't me. I don't have that in me. I don't have such words in me. I believe those were words from God. Now, if you didn't realize that, bummer for you. That shows you're asleep and you need to wake up. Because if God can come so near and we don't realize it or we, we don't really know what's going on, we're in trouble. We lost our skill. The fire is coming. We don't know how to fight. Scary stuff, man. Scary stuff. I believe we need God help us that we will have and he will provide for us a constant reminder of the emptiness of this life and this world. I want to be Paul Alonshui about the world, material things, comfort and all these things like we talked about last night. 
I want to be. I don't want to be addicted to those things. I don't want my heart to go after those things. I don't want my thoughts to go after those things. Why? Because I will become absolutely worthless and useless. And not, not only that, eventually dangerous. And so will you. So will you. And that's what Jesus does right here. He says, he pronounces to them, do you not see these things? Assuredly I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. All this thing that you're glorying in is going to be utterly destroyed. I mean, you could just be brand new married. Just got married and it's like, yeah, and she's going to be dead one day. And your family one day, the ones that you love with all your heart and that you're holding to and clinging to right now, every single one of them will be stripped out of your hands by death. And it's going to happen very soon. Very soon. What? What is that? That's called love. Because it's truth. And it's a wake-up call to stop loving the things of the world. Do not allow your heart to be set on the things of the world. Do not allow your affections to be set on an art display. Or good grades. Or a new computer or whatever it may be. Or a trip to the beach. Or a new church building. Why? Because it's all going to burn up. It's all going to be dissolved. It's all going to be stripped away. And very, very soon. Very soon. Very soon. Jesus is coming. And he's coming very soon. And one of the reasons I believe that we're asleep is because we do not understand that truth and that reality that Jesus is coming and he's coming soon. It's not a reality to us. It does not burn in our hearts. Therefore, we are easily worldly. We are easily uh, materialistic. We easily become distracted by worldly, temporal pleasures and things. We need the wake-up call. And that's my, my prayer, my desire for us on this retreat, is that God will give that wake-up call. That God will give that, that awakening. That God will cause you to see the reality of this thing. To experience the reality. The shortness of life. And the tragedy, if we set our heart on these things, that will become the absolute Tragedy. It's an absolute beiju. Absolute beiju. An absolute tragedy. That you will set your heart on worldly things. I don't mean, I'm not talking about bad worldly things. I just mean things of this world. Good or bad. But things of this world. And then you live for those things. Focus on those things. And, you, and then you're going to stand before the judgment. And you, then you will see. Oh, it was worthless. It was nothing. I gave up the treasures of the kingdom of heaven for nothing. It's gone now. It was nice while it lasted, but it's, that's the point. It's not going to last. That's the thing. It's not going to last. Whatever it is, it's not going to last. The buildings are going to be torn down. Not one stone will be left upon another. Your computer is going to fall apart. Your phone is going to be crushed into a thousand pieces. Your family, every one of them will leave you in death. Not a single one of them will remain by your side. They will all be stripped away in death or you'll be stripped from them in death. But you're all going to depart from each other and never meet again. At least not as a family. You will not be a family in heaven. There's no family in heaven. There's no marriage in heaven. 
you know, maybe we will, if they're saved, we will be, we will see each other, know each other. But it's not the same. It's all different then. This is only for now. There's no eternal love. It doesn't last. Not in the romantic sense. He rebuked his disciples. And maybe somehow I'm rebuking us as well. I don't, I don't know if you take it, if this is a rebuke. But, but what I, I, I hope is that we will be awakened, that we will not be asleep anymore, that we will see that we're sleeping and we'll wake up from our sleep and then we're going to fight with all of our might to never fall asleep again. Because like when I was praying, and I think it's important to listen when we are praying. I mean, sometimes some of the things we're praying, we're not just praying out of our own mind, but by the Holy Spirit. And some of the things I was praying about the Titanic. Do you know the story of the Titanic? Titan, Titan, what? The big ship, right? You know, they're racing along full speed. They've been warned about icebergs. Bing, shan. They've been war- warned, but they didn't listen. And they were not afraid. They were not concerned. They were not worried. And they're dancing and they're eating and they're having a good time. They're asleep on the path to great danger. They don't feel the danger. They don't see the danger. They don't hear the danger. They don't smell the danger. Therefore, they feel they're safe. I'm telling you, we are in danger. You're in danger. There is a shan, shan hu jiao, and if you do not get uh, your ship on course, you're going to shipwreck on the, on the reef. We need to wake up. So, we notice here, he just says that one verse to them in verse uh, two, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Listen, there's another sense, there's another sense where I do not believe that Jesus felt it was wrong for them to admire the temple and the way it's built. I don't believe he felt like it's always wrong to admire the way the temple is built. I don't believe that Jesus thinks it's wrong for us to enjoy a good meal or to enjoy your family or to even enjoy a holiday. I don't think that's the point of this. We don't want to go to an extreme where we we become ascetics. Ascetics are those that will not taste, touch, anything. They just won't eat, don't. And it's like, okay, they feel it's holy to eat bad food and wear poor clothing. I don't think that's right. I think that's, I don't think that's right. Um, And uh, because God made beautiful things. And we can, to a degree, that's the point, to a certain degree, a very minor degree, we can enjoy it, we should enjoy it. God's given us all things richly to enjoy, it says in Timothy. God's given us all things richly to enjoy. So he does say there is a point for enjoying things. But... Our tendency is to worship things. Our tendency is to idolatrize things, idolize things. Our tendency is to cling to things. That's why we have to be Paula Lomshri. And that's why he does that here. Is that clear? So, and then after that, notice what happens. Now, as he sat down on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? I believe they were humble. Listen to this. It, oh, I can feel like they were like shocked when he said oh, not one stone will. It would be like me saying, oh, Lola, this is your new computer. This will be become a pile of, a heap of garbage and 
utterly destroyed. Like the first thing out of my mouth is you start saying, oh, I got this new Viva book or whatever, Viva book. And I was like, this thing is absolutely a garbage and will fall to pieces. It is absolutely worthless and, and will burn in the lake of fire. And you're like, whoa. At first, maybe you were offended, right? But then you, you humbled yourself and you started thinking about it. This is the key, you guys. This is the key when you hear preaching, especially if you're being rebuked or whatever. Sometimes at the beginning, it's, it's offensive. It can hurt. But okay, and you feel offended maybe by it. Maybe his disciples felt offended. But at some point, they had to step back and say, and think about why would he do that? We were looking at the, the lake of the Sea of Galilee the other day, and he didn't rebuke us like this. Why is he now rebuking us? And they thought, think, okay, oh, maybe there's a point to it. Maybe he saw how we were not serious enough about holy things. He just preached this terrible message of judgment, and now we're talking about buildings and how pretty they are. Like our heart so easily falls away from the truth. We so easily go away from the high place down to a low place. Maybe we have to humble ourselves, and that's what you have to do. When you've been corrected, Jeffrey, you've got to hear this because you're going to, you've been corrected a lot and you will be corrected more. But you've got to hear this when you're offended by being corrected by me or whoever, or your mom or whatever. You might be offended. Your flesh, your pride will be offended. But you have to step away and say, wait a minute. Did they really have something to say? And if you think about it, if you humble yourself, God will show you. God will show you. And then you'll say, yes, there is a truth here. There is something here. And you will grasp it. And you will get it. And I believe the disciples here, I believe it's like they came back humbled. Because it's a time past. They're no longer just walking out of the temple. I think they were shocked. I think they were shocked when he said this. And I think they had to talk about it. And they had to think about it. And they prayed about it. And they humbled themselves. And now, what do we see in the next verse? This is awesome. It's like they have the right mindset now. Because now they're asking him about the end times. Do you see that? That's powerful. Do you see that? There's a, a switch here, and that's what God wants out of our church. He wants us, maybe he wants to rebuke us, and maybe we feel offended. Maybe we, it hurts us. Maybe it, it, it offends us and it hurts us. Okay, but let's step back a moment, humble ourselves. Is God trying to speak something to us? Is there something, is it, is it possible that my heart has gone astray? Is it possible that I, I'm in love with a computer? I'm in love with a car? I'm in love with a phone? I'm in love with my school or my grades? Or I'm in love with my, my food or whatever it may be? Is it possible that my heart is getting distracted by other things? Is it possible that I go from the holy things to, to a very uh, low place very easily? Yes, it's possible. And it's likely. And I think for most of us, it's the facts. The actual, legitimate facts of our actual present circumstances, I believe, is like this. Oh God, help us to hear your Holy Spirit and what he's saying to us. To take it to heart and to let the light come in. Let the light come in. Let us see the light and let us come back humbly to our Lord. And ask him. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? So they're going back to the previous conversation, isn't it? They're no longer asking about, you know, how pretty the buildings are. Now they're focused on the right thing. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now they're thinking about the right things, aren't they? Now they're thinking about the end of time. Now they're thinking about the kingdom of God coming. Now they're not thinking about worldly things. They're, they're not thinking about temporal things. They're thinking about eternal things. They're thinking about the things that Jesus is teaching them about. Now that's good. See how good a rebuke can be? See how good it can be to be Paul the You see how good it can be for the soul? It's so good for our soul if we receive it, isn't it? Now we've had the right mindset. Now we're asking the right questions. And now the Lord Jesus gives one of the greatest uh, teachings on the end times and the entire word of God. Because they humbled themselves and came and asked him a question. 
What revelation will Jesus, will Jesus give to our church, you guys, if we will humble ourselves, if we will receive the rebuke, if we will be wake, woken, waken, I don't even know the proper grammar, if we will allow ourselves to, to wake up, if we will wake up, and then we will humble ourselves and we'll come to the Lord and say, Lord God, what is it you want to say to me? How is it you want me to live the rest of my life? I'm so focused on how much money I make and what I do for a living on this and that. Maybe I need to be asking other questions. Maybe I need to be asking what is it that God wants me to do at this time. We're focused on the I Ching. We're focused on uh, China. We're focused on this and that. Maybe we're, we're thinking about the wrong things. Maybe we need to be asking different, different questions. Maybe we need to get our mind focused on what Jesus wants us to be focused on. Not what we are focused on naturally, because the things that men, um, the, the things that men love, or the things that men cherish, or the things that men appreciate, God despises them. That's what Jesus said. The things that men love, the things that men appreciate, God abhors them. Maybe we need to get our mindset more on God's side, huh? Get our mind thinking on what God's thinking about. To get our minds focused on what God is doing, on what God is planning, on what God is saying. Maybe we need to ask different questions. Maybe we need a different focus. I believe we do. I believe we need a, a, a righteous Focus, holy, God-fearing, alert. Maybe the most important thing in my life is my spiritual growth, my relationship with God. Maybe the second most important thing is how I, what I do for God. How I use my life for God. We need to ask the right questions to get the right answers. You know, another thing about this is very interesting to me is this. Think about this. If they didn't receive the rebuke, if they did not do some fanshi, if they did not humble themselves, and then they, oh yeah, and then they go and humbly ask him with the right mindset and the right questions. Jesus obviously had all these things that he wanted to tell them, but they couldn't receive it. How often is it that God has many things to give us, many gifts to give us, many anointings to pour out upon us, many revelations He wants to speak into our hearts, many things He wants to do through us and our families and our relationships, but we were not able to receive it because we are thinking about the wrong things. But the building is also God's temple. That's what they could think, but this is... this. this God's temple. No, no, you don't get it. We're not talking about religion here. We're talking about walking with God, the living God, right? Following God. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. The temple is empty. God is now leaving the temple, so leave with him. But they're like still back in the temple. No, leave that behind. God left the temple. Jesus Christ is God. He is the temple. He's the new temple. Follow him. But they say, but, 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 but the temple. Forget the temple. I left the temple. Follow me. And we get stuck in a religious habit, a religious pattern, a religious activity, and we think we served God. No, no, no. God's the living God. He's not dead. He's the living God. We can only serve him in the Holy Spirit, not in the flesh. You cannot serve Jesus out of ritual or out of habit. You can only serve him through the Holy Spirit. Did you hear that? You cannot serve God out of a habit. But from the heart by the Holy Spirit. God the Father is seeking worshipers who will worship him in the Holy Spirit according to truth. That's the only way we can serve God. So don't think that, well, I'm doing the right habit, that that counts. 
that you served God. No, it doesn't. It has to be done from the heart. It has to be done in the spirit. And I think part of our problem is that we get confused here. Jesus already left the temple, but we're still there. So, in other words, we are into the, the religious uh, form or activity, and we think that's good enough. And God's saying, no, I'm the living God. Serve me by your, through your, in your, with your heart, with your spirit, by the Holy Spirit, according to truth. Did you follow that last part? Can you follow? Here you go. No, it was too much. I mean the whole part about serving him. <coughs> so the point is, is that the temple is no longer effective. It's the, it was one day ordained by God, but God has left the temple. Jesus is the new temple. But the disciples, their mind is still on the temple. Look at these buildings. Look at these stones. And Jesus rebukes them. Do you understand? I'm using that as an illustration to say that we get stuck in religious patterns or habits. And we think that I'm still serving God because I went to church. No, it doesn't mean you're serving God because you went to church. Well, oh, but don't... Well, how can it not be? Because to really serve God, you need to not only go to church, but you need to go with your spirit and your heart and be filled and led by the Holy Spirit. And shen shang yiga, uh, yiga sheng jie jing bai, by the Holy Spirit. That's how you serve God. Not just by going to church. Okay? Can you follow? Yes. Oh, yeah? Good. Praise God. We're talking about very serious things. I have many, many things that I, else that I want to say, but I don't want to just say many things and then we forget them. I want us to take very seriously everything that we've heard up until now. I want God to confirm that what I'm saying is true. And that I want every one of us in our hearts to be absolutely certain that God spoke tonight. I heard God speak, that God spoke through his word. I want God, and I'm going to pray right now, God, I'm going to pray that you will confirm your word tonight. Everything that I'm speaking that is truly from you and it's truly your message for us, for your church, for this church I pray and I plead that you will confirm it from heaven. That you will give a sign, Lord God. That you will show clearly that this is the voice of God. That this is the word of God to us. This is the word of God to our church. And we must respond and we must obey. I pray, Lord God, that you will confirm it. And I pray the fear of God will fall upon us. That we will not take it lightly. And we will not take it casually. But we will take it as it is, the word of the living God. So I pray to you, Lord God, that you will confirm these words. And what is not from you, let it be forgotten and never remembered once again. But that which was from you, I pray that every word, not one jot or one tittle will fall to the ground. But every word, every phrase, everything that was spoken would be burned in our hearts and in our souls forever. That we would know that was from God. All the chaff, let it be burned up. But Lord, let the wheat, let it remain. Every word, Lord. Everything but from the Holy Spirit. Show us your goodness. Show us your mercy. Show everyone here your love. First, by bringing reality, conviction, light, and also showing the path of forgiveness, the path of repentance, the path of mercy. Oh, Lord, the path, Lord God, of, um, 
restoration and the path of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Please, Lord God, let our youth be deeply shaken, pierced, and convicted. And let our older people, whoever has heard this, also be be afraid, lest we be a stumbling block, be shaken, lest we waste our lives. God, be awakened, lest we love the things of this world. Because if we love the things of this world, the love of the Father is not in us. Oh, God. We need to be asking the right question. We need to be focused on the things you're focused on, not the things that our pressure of our life and our situation around us puts on us, but the things of heaven, the things of God, the things of above. Let us focus on you, Lord, on your kingdom and your will. That we may live differently and the people around us will think we're crazy because we see something they don't. But it's true, we do see something they don't see. We do know things they do not know. And they cannot see it, and they cannot know. Therefore, of course they will think we are out of our minds. But let us be willing to be fools for the sake of Christ. Help us, Lord, to not love the things of this world. Help us once again to to hear the call of heaven, to hear your call, deep calling into deep, you calling out to our hearts, calling us to come to you, calling us to worship you, calling us to seek after you, calling us, oh God, to spend time with you. Jesus, please I pray. Bless us. God, help us, help me to focus on heaven. Truly, Lord God, help me and all, everyone else. I pray for myself as well, as well, Lord, to focus on heaven, to focus on the judgment, to focus on the, on the, the mortar champagne, to focus on eternal life, to focus on eternal things, to focus on you, God. Please, Lord, help us. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like the morning clouds spread over the mountains, a people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations now therefore says the Lord turn to me with all your heart with fasting with weeping and with mourning so rend your heart and not your garments return to the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and great and of great kindness and he relents from doing harm who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind them, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, 
Gather the children and nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priest who ministers to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. Why should, the, why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations, but I will remove far from you the northern army, and I will drive him away into a barren and desolate land with his face toward the eastern sea and his back toward the western sea. His stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. My great army which I sent among you, uh, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. Therefore, therefore you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. The old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance. As the Lord has said, among the remnant, the remnant whom the Lord calls. Lord, once again I pray that you will send the, the sign and the confirmation that this message is from you. That everyone who's heard it will know in their heart that that was from God and I must respond to God. I believe that now is your time to uh, respond to God. If God has spoken to you or dealt with you, 
or rebuked you, now is your time to um, call out to God, reach out to God, receive his message. Don't let, um, don't let it fall on deaf ears or on a hard heart. Don't let the, the seed of his word fall into the stony ground or on the path so that it gets trampled up. Let it go deep in your heart. That's why it says to to um, rend your hearts and not your garments and to put on sackcloth and ashes and to break up your fallow ground. You've got to do something. You need to respond in your heart and your soul and to the word of God that it will, that it will not be choked out by your own wickedness. So you have to you know, respond the right way to God's message. You have to receive it. It has to fall in good soil. It can be the very word of God, but fall in by, by bad soil, and it won't bear any fruit. But it was from God. It was God's word. It was God's message. It was God's truth. But why didn't it bear fruit then? Because it fell in bad soil. Be sure that you are tonight hearing the word with a good soil heart, not bad soil. Lord God, Lord, Lord, I pray, God, I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit, Lord, help me, God, to bring the fear of the day of, the day of judgment, Lord. God, I pray, Lord, let them be, be, be real, realistic, Lord God, let them be beyond reality, Lord God. I pray, Lord, let me fear them, Lord God. Lord, let, let them be in my heart, Lord God, every time. I think about it, Lord. Let me be fear. Let me let me fear of it, Lord God. Lord, let me let me be reminded, Lord, of the coming of Jesus Christ, Lord. Lord God, and I need to be ready, Lord God. I need to be awakened, Lord. And Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit, Lord, help me, God. Lord, to revelate, Lord God, of how serious is it, of how serious it is, Lord God. It's not a joke, Lord. I pray, Lord, that your spirit, Lord God, open my eyes, Lord. Lord God. Lord, I surrender everything, Lord God, that I I can't do nothing, Lord. But Lord, I trust in your Holy Spirit, Lord God, and you change me, Lord, and you are able, Lord God, to change my perspective, my point of view, Lord God. That you can make me view things differently, Lord. I pray you change me, God. You change me, Lord. You change me, Lord God. Lord, please, Lord God, do your work, Lord. Lord, for you are all. You are our only hope, Lord God. There is none who can help us, Lord, but only you, Lord. And I pray, Lord God, you open my eyes, Lord. Lord God, or else I'll be doomed, Lord God. Lord God, please, Lord, open my eyes, Lord. Let me see, Lord God, the danger I'm being cold, I'm being lukewarm, Lord. Let me take these wordings seriously, Lord. Let me not let me not go back immediately after hearing those wordings, Lord. But Lord, let us be like the disciples, Lord God. Humbling ourselves, Lord. You show us, Lord. Pray, Lord God, give us the heart to fear you more, Lord God. Lord, Holy Spirit, Lord God, I depend on you, Lord. I depend on you, God. You are, you are my only hope, Lord. There's none who I can depend on, Lord. But you, Lord God, you are the God who change. You are the God who change sinners. You are the God that change the heart of Everyone, Lord God, and I pray, Lord, that you change my heart. Lest it grow colder and harder, Lord. Mercy, Lord.
mercy on me, Lord God. Have mercy on us, Lord.
disciples that walk with you are so foolish. How much more us, Lord God, when we only know you from a distance. Oh God, we don't walk with you on the earth. Please have pity on us. Have pity on us in our ignorance, in our lack of spirituality, in our tendency to go towards the world or towards carnal things. Lord, give us an extra grace, an extra anointing, an extra outpouring of the Holy Spirit. you come in a greater way upon us. Come within us. Come upon us.